and we will be ready to start. Okay, the recording is started. Good morning, welcome back everybody to the second lecture. Um, we're just gonna start with the comments that are in the chat and then we will proceed and go forward. So Anita says, um, when babies are born, deformed, and we are preaching to them or uh, or their parents, uh, preaching to their parents, I guess, uh, still can we say that they are wonderfully, beautifully made in God's image? How can we explain that? Um, the answer is yes. We still declare that they are, they are wonderfully and fearfully made, the Bible tells us, Psalm 139. Now, we know that maybe there is a physical, there's a problem, you know, in um, uh, something. So, the you know, example, you take the man who was born blind. He's born that way. Uh, and he was born deformed. Uh, his eyesight didn't come clear. Uh, but we definitely say, you know, he's, he's created in the image of God. He's uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, part of what's happened that his, his eyes have not been formed well or formed right. He's blind. Uh, we are aware of that. But that's when we can pray for things to come into alignment to God's original design. So uh, a miracle or the supernatural power of God in, in this case is simply bringing things to their original design uh, by the power of God. And so that's what we are to do. Jesus said, you know, we are here to work the works of God. But can we call them originally one fearfully wonderfully made? Yeah, we can. We still and we must you know, recognize each person is fearfully and wonderfully made. Hope um, uh, we got a big challenge joining online classes. Um, is there a possibility to move into the e-learning portal? There seems to be a technical issue. So Let's see now, we are 21st October. Um, so hope uh, the way we set up the e-learning portal is people can register at any time. So there should not be a problem to register, uh, but there will be a problem in trying to finish the course unless you can sit on it and do it. Uh, because uh, the way the e-learning portal is set up is you will have to listen to each lecture. You'll have to go through each uh, video lecture uh, before you progress to the next one. So uh, example, in this course, uh, there would be, uh, I don't know how many videos, but I think let's say 24 videos or something that you have to go through. Uh, and you cannot move to the next one until you finish the previous one. Uh, so it's going to be a lot to finish. And the last date is November 26th. Um, so uh, it's going to be difficult to do that. Um, well, uh, uh, so registering is not an issue, but going through the course would be an issue, Un unless unless you have you know several weeks that you're just going to sit and keep listening to the lectures and trying to cover it, catch up with it all. Um, you know, and if you have the time and you want to do that, I'm I'm sure you you can do it, but. Uh, you know, the time window is very short till November 26, the last day of classes. Yeah, uh, try registering. Uh, you should be able to log in, you should be able to register. We haven't put a deadline on that part. Uh, so if you still have a problem, just send an email. I can tell the IT guys to look into it, but I think you should be able to register, not a problem. Okay. Um, okay, any other questions? All right. Samuel, okay. Samuel, please go ahead. Um, thank you, thank you, Pastor. Uh, this might be slightly off topic, but I think somehow related, uh, especially Sai's comment uh, triggered this in me. I read an essay about um, the scientific community investing, uh, like a certain division, investing into immortality, immortality um, a whole thing on cell regeneration and uh, elongating the duration of a cell in the human body and even looking at other forms of uh, 
uh, brain transplant into a machine. So I know it sounds all science fiction type, uh, but so so I think it's it's man's endeavor towards uh, increasing lifespan, which is in in a little uh, in in some sense trying to escape the bondage of corruption. Uh, I, 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 at least that's how I'm looking at it right now. Um, and so your comments on my pastor, uh, what if it, like, you know, uh, I don't know if you see any substantial progress in it, but uh, but if, if a time emerges where you know, this whole concept of uh, some fusion, some cloning, things like that, start up, so uh, what's the... What's a believer's perspective approach to that? Hmm. Yeah, um, so, uh, and this is just my personal, my personal view or my personal understanding. I'm not saying this is chapter and verse. Um, what, what I would say, the way I would look at it is that uh, there's nothing wrong uh, for man to try and improve the quality of life or in some instances the the quantity you know, the length of life uh, there's nothing wrong in that and uh, you know and, and, and in some ways you know we're already doing that you know by through medicine to medical help uh, you know somebody would have died maybe you know because of medical intervention they get you know another 20 years added uh, they live 20 years more and so on so so uh, in some way we are doing that and then, so there's nothing wrong if uh, we are using our knowledge, our skill, and ability to try to see how we can improve the length of life or the quality of life, uh, so on. Uh, so to that extent, yeah, it's it's fine. Will man be uh, will man be, be able to create something that's eternal or immortal? Uh, that that's a big question. I I, I think uh, the answer is no because. We are finite, and uh, you know, uh, and eventually, God and God is going to step in. God is going to intervene to wrap things up. Uh, but is it wrong to engage in that kind of research and right kind of effort? I don't think it's wrong. Uh, I think it's a good thing that if we can improve uh, uh, life on Earth to whatever extent we can, we should try. And I don't think it's wrong. That's just my personal perspective. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go back now to uh, um, our notes. So what we did was we looked at reason number one on why there is suffering, right? There's a bondage of corruption. Now I haven't read, uh, we haven't read this passage, but you can read it. Again, Paul talks about the fact that we groan in this earthly body and we know that you know God will give us uh, this earthly body is like a, ta a tabernacle or a tent, which we will put off and then we will have glorified bodies, right? But uh, I, I think this passage in Romans 8 kind of bears all of that out uh, and so on. So we know this, there's the bondage of corruption. We must be aware. Now, um, there is nothing wrong for us to use our faith to undo this, you know, to work against this bondage of corruption. Uh, and there's nothing wrong in that, that by faith we, you know, whether it's healing, whether it's miracle, whether it's, you know, but by faith we are working against this because this came in through because of sin, right? And so through faith and through our place in God, we work against it and there's nothing wrong in that. Um, then the, the second one is suffering due to one's own, one's own action, right? And this is something we will understand easily, which means that, um, you know, sometimes we suffer because, look, our, our own negligence, you know, maybe we made a mistake, we did something we're not supposed to do, or we failed to do what we're supposed to do, then we face the consequences of that, right? Uh, and then we can't blame God, uh, or we can't blame other people. Uh, we have to take responsibility for our actions, and we can think of so many different uh, cases. And uh, you know, in, in in times like this, uh, we should not blame God. You know, it's kind of funny. You know, somebody uh, does something, uh, you know, uh, and then they say God 
God, God made made this to happen to me, to for me to suffer. No, take responsibility for your action. You know, for example, we can think of so many scenarios, but you know, if uh, let's take a one one example where if if a person, you know, uh, uh, takes some of his money and he invests it and puts it somewhere where he's, you know, he's uh, it's an unwise investment. Uh, and then he suffers losses. Uh, he shouldn't blame God. You know, I said, look, uh, you made an investment. You you were responsible. You made the choice to put money into it, and uh, things went wrong. And uh, and now take responsibility, and you know, find out why. Uh, you know, what what did you miss in looking at before you made the investment, and so on. Okay, so like this, you could think of so many examples. And um, the Bible is clear in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Uh, it says, you know, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap what is eternal life. So, you know, this is again a, 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 a law that God put in place. You know, whatever you sow, you will reap. So we need to be mindful of that. And then we need to make our sowing right that means whatever we're investing our time effort energy in uh, what the actions are the things we do uh, you choose to do things that are going to be uh, that are going to have good results so positive so suffering can happen simply because of our own actions but then uh, what what we do must keep in mind is uh, that in the in this context uh, that there is the mercy of god you know, that uh, uh, in uh, Psalm 25, verse 15, you know, he's, uh, the psalmist prays. He says, Lord, uh, uh, I find my feet in the net, but, you know, you will bring me out of the net. So he's the one who walked into it, but now he's looking to God to bring him out of it, right? So uh, sometimes we make mistakes and we get ourselves trapped. We get ourselves into trouble. But that's when the mercy of God is there. We look to God and say, God, please get me out of this. Um, and, uh, and and the mercy of God, God in his mercy will, um, you know, uh, bring us out of trouble. God in his mercy will lessen the degree of the consequences. You know, that's the mercy of God. So, so, uh, so we're not ruling out the mercy of God. But what we are saying is there will be consequences for the choices we make. You know, so for example, in First Peter 2, verse 11, it says uh, that fleshly lusts trouble the soul. You know, so if a person is indulging in fleshly lusts, even if it's a believer, well, uh, he's going to find that his soul, his mind, will, and emotions are weakened and uh, are being troubled. Now, we can't blame God for that. The thing is, these fleshly lusts have to be dealt with. And uh, the believer has to deal with that, right? address that uh, in order to bring wholeness to mind, will, and emotions. Sometimes we get distracted and we end up wasting time and energy. Uh, we can't blame God for it. We've got to refocus and get ourselves back. You know, and we can think of many examples. Think of Abraham. You know, He's a father of faith, but he birthed Ishmael. And then he faced trouble in his own house. Uh, David committed sin. David neglected taking care of Absalom, and there were consequences. So uh, this applies, this rule, so to speak, applies to everybody, whether it's Abraham or David or anybody else. You know, um, uh, they when we do wrong, we will face the consequences, but we look to God for his mercy. And um, uh, in, in the middle of our mistakes, you know, we, we should say, okay, Lord, help me to learn from my mistake. So even mistakes that we make uh, can serve good. I'm not saying go and make mistakes, but I'm saying when we do make mistakes, uh, it can serve us good in the sense that we can learn from the mistakes. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, so in that sense, there's a learning that happens, which is definitely can benefit us. And God is greater than our mistakes. So that's when we look to God and he can uh, 
not only resolve the things, but he can then turn it around um, uh, in his mercy for our good, right? And uh, also remember this, that, you know, sometimes uh, we try to help others, you know, and we try to help them, counsel them, but they go and still do their own thing. Then, uh, then we are not responsible. If they end up in things that cause them pain, because we did counsel them, we did tell them, hey, don't do it, but they still went ahead and then they face the consequences. So that's the second part, you know, which is our own actions. We may do wrong things, we face the consequences, uh, but thank God we can, for his mercy, he brings us out. We can learn from our mistakes. God can help resolve uh, our mistakes. A third reason of suffering that we see in the Bible is because, directly because of Satan's works, right? Um, that means the devil does things that cause pain. They cause people the suffering, right? Uh, some of the clearest example, or perhaps one of the most clearest examples sat in the book of Job. In the book of Job, uh, chapters one and two, it says, Satan went from the presence of the Lord and he did these things. In other words, you know, um, it wasn't God who did it. God said, oh, yeah, you know, God gave Satan permission in the sense that, okay, you, you know, you're on the earth and you have access to the earth through man's fall. Uh, Satan could boast, you know, all the kingdoms of the earth are given to me. God didn't, even Jesus didn't, uh, uh, this, what to say, dispute that claim, right? So he said, yeah, Satan has control of this earth. He is the God of the earth. Uh, and so even in Job's case, you know, it was basically God saying, yeah, you know, that's your playground. You know, you, you can do what you want with it in your playground. Um, and so Satan went forth, smote Job. But he did all these calamities and you know, all kinds of things you will read in Job chapter one and two, which all of us have read. Uh, we see uh, uh, weather conditions coming in and causing things happen. Uh, Job's children being uh, losing their lives, cattle, family, uh, uh, workers, so many things happening. And we see it was the direct result of Satan at work. So there's uh, satanic oppression happening. And there are many places in scripture that we read. Uh, we read of Satan doing things. You know, we can think of uh, the ministry of Jesus, uh, where it says, you know, he, he went about healing all who are oppressed to the devil. So there you clearly see in Acts 10, 38, people were oppressed of the devil. They were not oppressed by God. They were oppressed by the devil and Jesus brought healing to them. Uh, the woman was bent over. Jesus said, Satan has bound her. So her physical condition was caused because of Satan, a spirit of infirmity causing that. There are times when Jesus ministered to those who have, you know, had different, uh, di different physical conditions. They were deaf or dumb and he cast out the spirit and they could speak or they could sp see. So you find that spirits are affecting certain parts of the body causing those conditions. In the case of um, the Apostle Paul, uh, Paul talks about a thorn in the flesh. So uh, he says, a messenger of Satan. So this thorn in the flesh was not a physical sickness or disease, but, but it was a messenger of Satan, meaning a demon, demonic power, demonic spirit uh, that was causing all the problems that Paul was facing in his ministry. And in chapter 11, he describes all of his problems, you know, that he suffered uh, persecutions and shipwreck and uh, all of those things. But they were coming, uh, there was a messenger of Satan, demonic spirit of Satan coming against him over and over again and causing all of these things. And in the middle of all that, God says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So um, like this, we see many examples in scripture uh, that Satan comes against us uh, to hinder us in the purposes of God. And I, and I mentioned these two, Acts 10 and Luke 13. So, um, uh, uh, you know, Satan is doing his work. But 
while Satan is doing all of this, God has given us what we need to stand victorious. He's given us the weapons of warfare. He, he's given us the word. And he's given us all of that. Now, you know, some people will say, oh, but look at Job. He suffered. Well, you and I don't have to be Job. Why? Because Job did not have the cross. Job did not have the word of God. Job did not have the name of Jesus. Job did not have the armor of God. Uh, Job didn't have any of that. He didn't have the whole anointing of the Holy Spirit. He, he didn't have all of that. He didn't know about it. So you and I don't have to be Job. Job is an example in the Bible of what happened to a man. But you and I are in a situation much better than Job. We've got the weapons of our warfare. We've got everything we need to stand successfully and victoriously against Satan. So we are in a totally different position than Job. So, you know, it's wrong for a believer to say, I'm Job or I'm like Job. No, you're not. You know, you, you shouldn't say that because you're on this side of the cross and look at all that God's given you that Job didn't have, right? So Satan is still doing stuff, but we have been given things to live victorious. And uh, while he comes against us, you know, to attempt us or attack us, uh, the things that are designed to harm us can only serve to perfect us into the image of Jesus. Right? So uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at things that way, hey, whatever Satan is trying to do against me, whether he's going to tempt me, he's going to attack me, I've got everything I need to stand victorious, and his coming against me is only serving to perfect me into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the that's all you know. That's why God's permitted us to be here. That uh, you know, it's as we go about the purpose of God, preaching the gospel and serving God and serving His people. There's this enemy who's trying to interfere, and everything he does can be turned around into perfecting us into the image of Jesus Christ, as we use what God has given to us. Right? Now. Other things we see, uh, Satan tries to obstruct and delay uh, the miracles, uh, delay uh, the, the plans of God. We see that in Daniel. He tried to do that. So obviously we think we can know that he'll try to do similar things these days. Uh, but what must we do? Uh, we just stand. We continue believing and say, no, Satan, you are not going to have the final say. I will have the final say based on the word of God. What God has said for me, I will possess. I will walk in my inheritance, right? And uh, so we um, deal with those things uh, using what God has given to us. Now, we know that Satan will try to interfere in life situations. He'll try to cause failure. He'll try to cause breakdown in marriage. He'll try to hinder progress, cause sickness, disturb emotionally. Uh, a lot of these things can be demonic in origin. That means there are spirits at work, spirits of uh, darkness at work. And so we need to take authority over those things, right? So there is suffering that is caused directly due to satanic oppression. So we recognize that the devil is a thief coming to steal, kill and destroy. But as far as a believer is concerned, we have to use what God has given to us against this. You know, we discern, okay, this is the enemy at work. We exercise our God-given authority. Uh, we stand firm. We don't quit just because the battle may be uh, longer than we expected. We keep standing. And uh, we must not blame God for what the devil is doing. You know, this is sad. And sometimes people think we are being arrogant when we say this. But look, don't blame God for what the devil's doing. Uh, if the devil is causing sickness, don't go and say, God has given me this sickness to teach me a lesson. Now, God is so good, he's going to put up with it. He's not going to, you know, slap you in the face. <laughs> but that doesn't mean what you're saying is right. You know? Uh, so we have to be careful, discern that, hey, it's the devil who causes these things. And uh, it's not right for me to blame God. But instead, I need to take what God has given to me to stand up against what the enemy is doing. 
right? And another thing is this. Uh, God wants us to take action against the devil. You know, uh, he told us, resist the devil. He didn't say he would resist the devil for us. You know, James 4, 7, 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 say, tells us, resist the devil. So who's got to resist the devil? I, you, we as believers, we must resist the devil. So sometimes we are waiting for God to do what he told us to do. I'm waiting for God to deliver me. I'm waiting for God to, listen, God told you to resist the devil. So if you don't resist the devil, God's not going to do it for you. Right? So we must understand that because that's all in the word and we have to follow the instruction uh, um, from the word. Right? So uh, we, uh, we, we must understand what God has given to us. Okay, so let me pause and, um, you know, if there are any comments here on these second and third points, one is suffering due to our personal actions, suffering due to demonic oppression. Let me just see if there are any questions or comments before we go forward. Okay. Did Satan take the lives of Job's sons? Can Satan kill, take lives? Um, yeah, the answer is yes, right? Through direct and indirect means. So the indirect means would be, you know, whether it's a physical calamity or whether it is causing spirits of suicide, depression, uh, fear, torment, you know, so he brings all of these things in and then, uh, 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 then people end up committing suicide or taking their lives. So, yeah. So, he's a, he just said he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so, the enemy uh, uh, instigates, it is instrumental in that, towards that. And then people, you know, end up with destroying their lives and so on. And Or, or it's calamities that happen that are destructive in nature. Kennedy, go ahead, please. Thank you, thank you. Can you can you please shed some light on the issue of uh, the blood curses, the ancestral curses, or the bloodline curses? Mm. Okay, so we find this in the Old Testament, Exodus. Uh, I think it's in Exodus twenty. So Kennedy's question is about um, bloodline curses or uh, things that come through the bloodline. So, um, so what, hap what we see is in the Old Testament, God said he would visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation. That means the effect of sin continues in what we say, the bloodline meaning in the succeeding generations up to the third and fourth generation. So it's from that where, you know, people are recognized that, hey, there is this possibility. But I say, why do I say there is this possibility? Because this can always be stopped. That means, let's say one generation did some sin, whatever sin, they, they did sin. Sin always opens the door. But let's say the very next generation uh, turns to God and lives righteous. They have the right not to be under the consequences of the sins of the forefathers. Why? Because they're now turned to God. So, but if they don't turn to God, then the door that has been opened continues to remain open. And so they will continue to face the consequences of that sin or sins uh, in their lives. Okay. So that whole concept of, or not concept, that the whole truth of 
the judgment of sin being passed on to the third and fourth generation must be understood in the light of the rest of scripture. What does the rest of scripture say? The rest of scripture says the soul that sins, it shall die. That means each one is responsible for their own sin. But we do understand when doors are opened, it continues if the sin continues. But if somebody repents and turns to God, they don't have to be in subjection to that bondage. But what we do know is that the enemy will try to use that to continue to oppress people. So that's why they call it a curse. Because a door has been opened. Sin opens the door. The previous generation has opened the door. The enemy has gained some foothold. And he will try to trouble the next generation um, if you know, even they turn and they repent to the Lord, he will try to use it. But they don't have to be subject to it. Especially when you come into the New Testament, we know in the New Testament, uh, we know a lot more than the people in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we know that the blood of Jesus Christ redeems us, that there is this complete transfer from darkness into light. That means Satan has no more claim, no more access, no more right over us. So even if, let's say, the preceding generation committed sin, uh, let's just say example that they committed murder. So obviously it's a sin. It opened the door to the enemy uh, to come in and work in the family. But the next generation turned to the Lord. So they have every right to walk free from any influence of whatever spirit of murder or uh, thing, may, a spirit of destruction that may have come into the previous generation. They don't have to be in subjection to it. Why? Because you're you're now in the kingdom of light. So what do you do? Just renounce it. Say, Satan, you have no access over me. Uh, whatever may have, you know, uh, my forefathers may have opened the door. You have no right over me, no claim over me. I'm not giving you any access. I am free. I've been delivered and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And I'm not expecting to be in subjection to any of these things. And that's it. It's as simple as that. Uh, we don't have to make it any more complicated. We understand the spiritual reality of uh, uh that sin opens the door and it can be passed on. But we also understand the greater reality of the redemption that we have in Christ. And that's what we walk in. Does that answer your question, Kennedy? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank okay. you. Okay, Avani, you need to want to say something, ask something? Yes, Pastor. I want to understand uh, this thing. Jesus, uh, after his bapti uh, he was baptized in Jordan, he uh, cast out demons and he raised the dead and everything he did. And then uh, he goes on the cross and then he defeats the devil on the cross. So, And before that, he even gives his disciples the power and authority over demons and everything happens. Now, in... In Colossians 2, 14, 15, we say that is the time he disarmed the rulers and he uh, did everything on the cross to defeat the devil. And uh, he was already doing that even before the cross. And uh, then we read about uh, him doing that on the cross. And then uh, the disciples are given the fullness of Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So I want to understand. Uh, Jesus was already, um, uh, you know, doing the miracles and uh, all the things. Uh, he was disarming the um, Satan even before the cross. So what difference, uh, how to understand the difference between the two uh, pre-crucifixion and post-crucifixion? What difference did it make basically? Uh, and, and, and even though Jesus defeated the devil on the cross, he is still working the same way as he did it before the cross. So uh, I just wanted to understand it in the big, bigger picture. I hope my question is clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll just reference one scripture here and I just um, mm -hmm. All right. Matthew 8, 16, 17. So here's the thing. Before the cross, Jesus healed people. Jesus forgave sin. Um, Jesus worked miracles. And he commissioned his disciples to go do the same thing before the cross. 
And Matthew 8, 16, 17 says, you know, whatever he did, he did it that it might be fulfilled what was spoken. And he, and he quotes Isaiah and he says, this happened the cross. So two things you must understand. The cross was something that took place in time, about 2,000 years ago. But the cross took place in the mind of God before the creation of the world. That's why Revelation 13, I think verse 8, it says, um, and, and other places also in First Peter 1.18, it says, He was a lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. So, two things. In time, Christ died on the cross. But before he died in time, he already died, so to speak, in the mind of God. That means the cross was a finished work even before Adam was created. So Hebrews 4.3, the works were finished before the foundation of the world. So the cross was a finished work before Adam was created. In the spiritual realm, in the mind of God, it was done. So everything Jesus was doing before the cross in time was like, I'm doing this because this is spiritual truth. And I'm doing this because as a down payment, I'm doing it because the work is going to be done. So I have the authority to do this. That means he was forgiving sin on the basis of what was going to take place in time to come. That's why he could forgive sin before the cross. It's like, I can forgive your sin because I'm going to pay not only for your sin, I'm going to pay for the sins of the world. So I have a right to forgive your sin because I am going to go and make the payment. So you can understand it in that sense. And you can also understand it in the sense that, look, in the mind of God, I have already made the payment. So I have the authority to forgive you your sin. So whether it is in time, he's authorized to do it before the cross because he was going to go and do it on the cross. Or whether it is before God, because in the mind of God, it was already a finished work. So now the cross happens. And as Jesus dies physically and everything takes place, it's a fulfillment of what already took place in the mind of God. And we are living on the other side of the cross where it is Satan. So on the cross, Jesus did everything. He defeated Satan. He disarmed principalities. So we are on the other side of the cross where the payment has been made. And we're living out of that. So before the cross, the payment was going to be made so he could borrow from it. The payment is made. Now we are living out of that. So both are very valid. The payment has been made in full. So whether you borrow ahead of time or you do it after time, both are valid. Payment has been made in full, in time. But the payment was already made in full in the mind of God before time began. So Jesus was ministering out of both these contexts. I'm going to pay for it. It's already been done in the mind of God. But on this side of the cross, payment has been made, but it's also true. It was already done in the mind of God before time began. So today we can say, Satan, you have been defeated. Satan, you are underneath my feet. The key is, before the cross, after the cross, the key is revelation. For those who understood it, they could walk in it. So revelation is important. The knowledge of the truth is important. So in both the Old and the New Testament, God says, you know, in the Old, he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. In the New, he says, 
if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So knowing the truth is important in both before and after the cross. Does that help? Or did I confuse you? Okay. Okay, good. So, so everyone is with that uh, so far. We've looked at suffering because of bondage of corruption, suffering because of one's own actions, suffering because of satanic oppression. Okay, let me just see. We have another question here from Rose for a new believer. How do you explain the Christian work is with trials and battles from the enemy? So we can tell, you know, the way we understand it is that when we are born again, so we can explain this to them. Like when we are born again, we are spiritually we are transferred from darkness to light. We are transferred from the powers of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. That's you know, Colossians 1, 13, 14. So spiritually, God does that. But he leaves us, but we are living on this earth where Satan and his demons have been, are, are, are continuing to operate. They are still continuing to do their evil work. But for the believer, or before the believer, they are powerless. Because the believer is walking in what Christ finished. But they will come against the believer, trying their guerrilla tactics. You know, they'll try to, uh, they will pretend to harass, or they will try to harass, they'll try to tempt, they try to. Uh, work on the weaknesses of the believer, and so they try to do that. So as long as on this earth, we are like on we are like on enemy territory for the time being, and uh, we're going to face things from the enemy. But God has given us what we need to live victorious to overcome. So spiritually, we have been transferred in our physical life on earth. We are walking on enemy territory, so to speak. So we're going to face these things and we have to overcome. Is that okay? All right. So I think we'll pause here, uh, take some time to think about these things. Um, the, the reason we are trying to understand for suffering um, and then we will cover the rest next week. Hopefully we'll be able to um, finish this chapter uh, on suffering next week. Okay, uh, let's um, take a moment to pray and then we will dismiss and we will see see you again after the break uh, in the other class. Could somebody um, just pray with us and dismiss us, please? Pastor, can I pray? Please go ahead, Shikama. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, praise you, honor you for this wonderful morning. Father, we ask you more grace in our life, Lord Master, when we go through the challenges in our life, O oh God, when we face the tribulations, when we pay, face the persecutions, O oh God. Lord, we pray that, Father, let we not stagger in faith, but Lord Master, let we be Lord Master, let we know the truth and face. Lord Master, and let be able to overcome those challenges, O Father. Let the sufferings should never be an obstacle for our growth and walk with God, o Father. But Lord Master, let be able to overcome it and move further. And Father, believing on your faithfulness, believing on your love and grace, let be able to, Lord Master, shine for your kingdom and for your glory. We thank you for, Lord Master, every single word, what we learn to your God, let it deeply rooted in us and let it be a blessing for us. Thank you for your servant of God. Lord, strengthen him, bless him, and Father God, use him mightily. Thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to hear from you. All the glory, honor, and praises belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, God bless you all. Um, we will see you soon in the next class. Take a good break. See you now. God bless.